Thanks, Kevin. Can you guys just move forward? <laughs> go on, go on. I, I actually physically can't spit as far as the first row, <laughs> even if I try. Thanks. <laughs> I know you're all shy. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. All right. Although I've done this a few times, I am actually quite nervous. So if I disappear suddenly, it's because I have to go and pee again. Um, but uh, just talk amongst yourselves. And um, I'm going to be one of those annoying people that moves off the mic, which is uh, which I, I hate if I'm operating. So here we go. All right. So introduction-wise, uh, those... Oops, there we are. He told me how to do it too. Uh, those who don't know me, I'm Cathy. Kathy Nosley. Uh, I've got a, over 25 years, I know it's hard to believe, um, industry experience. I've, I come from being a technician. Uh, I come from the floor, I like to say. Uh, I've also worked a lot in events, uh, doing sort of event logistics, site management type thing on events. And somewhere along the line, um, I realised I was quite in... I think it's because I'm a little bit cup half empty. I'm quite good at health and safety. So I went and did a diploma in it uh, and started up my own company, Hivers Event Management. Um, and the bottom one is um, Hazan's Registered, which uh, is a little bit like being a master builder for a health and safety professional. So um, you don't have to use me uh, if you're wanting to have somebody look over your health and safety stuff, but I highly recommend you get somebody uh, who is on the Hazans Register because they've been certified as um, having done the work to know what, what they're talking about. This uh, presentation is brought to you by Silicon Scholarship. Um, thank you very much, Silicon Scholarship. Last year, um, I was lucky enough to attend the Event Safety Summit in Pennsylvania. Um, and, ooh, that way. <coughs> <clears throat> in Rock Littitz, Pennsylvania, which I know you've never heard of unless you've heard of the Event Safety Summit because it's a tiny little town in the middle of rural Pennsylvania. Um, and the Event Safety Alliance is an organisation set up in the States following the Indiana State Fair where um, uh, you've probably all seen the footage of the massive stage collapsing. Um, they did the, the very sensible thing of going, we are about to get hit by a whole lot of regulations, so we're going to drive it from the industry. So we're going to set up this organisation and we're going to look after our own safety. So that's what, uh, what the Event Safety Alliance does. And every year they hold Event Safety Summit. Um, and Jeff said, I hope there's some pictures. This is for you, Jeff. Uh, this is a really cool place, and I could just do the whole presentation on this, which would be way more interesting than safety and design, so I just, just indulge me a little bit with this. Rock Lit it's, is cool. It's a very cool complex. This is the building. It's like a big, huge aircraft uh, hangar, and what happens in here is that anybody that's doing a stadium, well, not, not everyone, but a lot of performers doing stadium gigs or arena gigs come here to rehearse and sort out their tech stuff. So these are the nearest neighbours. It's all farmland. <laughs> As I said, it's right in the middle of rural Pennsylvania, which is Amish country, which is, I think, kind of quite a nice little sort of yin-yang thing because you've got these people who sort of shun technology and these people who are just overly technological um, and it's sharing the same backyard. That's the inside of the building. Um, it's uh, all geared up with, you know, ratings up the wazoo. Uh, massive as structure and uh, and as I say they go in there they set up all their staging uh, they do all the technical and um, they might be there for um, several months at a time there's a campus there that uh, within the campus is lighting uh, providers video uh, people who make video stuff um, there's flight case manufacturers there's people who provide the uh, supply lecky tape, uh, all of those sorts of things, all within the one campus. There's also a rock climbing wall, a yoga studio, and a craft brewery. <laughs> and the coolest digs ever. Uh, seriously, <laughs> Rock Littitz Hotel is set up to be backstage. Brand new, we were the first lot through there. Per diem is the name of the, um, of the, the restaurant. They, no qualms, they're taking your money off you. Uh, each floor is themed. 
lighting, um, effects, uh, staging, they're all sponsored. And um, this is the sort of thing that's uh, decorating. And this is my hotel room. So the, to the, the bathroom door is a flight case lid. <laughs> and the wallpaper on the inside is all made up of, of backstage passes. So you walk into this place and you just feel like you're at home. <laughs> And this is the bit that I'm meant to be talking about. <clears throat> so uh, what we end up with is the most over conference ever. Uh, there were 400 people there. They were all into event safety. It was, it was a dream come true for me. I was, I'd found my people. Um, the biggest um, video wall I'd ever seen. Um, amazingly cool. Um, <clears throat> and we talked about safety uh, in there. So the theme of the conference was designing for safety. Now, interestingly enough, like the theme for most conferences, uh, it didn't actually really stick to topic, and I didn't learn a lot about designing for safety uh, at the particular conference. Uh, they were looking at a lot of stuff, crowd management, um, a lot of weather safety. It was more towards events. But fortunately, I've had an interest in safety and design for a while, and I've attended another course on that uh, here in New Zealand through the health and safety um, channels, so I can still talk to it. But for Silicon Scholarship point of view, I did learn an awful lot of other stuff. <laughs> so design and entertainment, and I've just listed up there a whole lot of stuff, and you can probably think of other stuff, but this is the sort of thing, obviously, that we ha we're dealing with, uh, with design. One, one of the things for me is venue design, um, and I, it, I wouldn't want to be the p people that have anything to do with venue design because you're never going to please anyone. But it is, uh, that's sort of where it starts in a lot of cases, uh, how safe are the designs of the venues. And personally, I still go on tour occasionally and I've been to some fairly new venues and I'm still finding that I'm hanging from my, my knees trying to focus lights because uh, somebody hasn't thought about the position of the lighting bars relative to the sound baffles. Um, so it's something that needs to be considered at all these levels, and I'm not saying that hasn't been considered and discarded, uh, that's probably the case, uh, but it is something that, uh, yeah, that, that's sort of dear to my heart. For me, I do a lot of event stuff, so site management, <coughs> how to design a site so that the crowds are safe, that kind of thing, um, programs and activities, designing, um, actually the, the classic safety thing is uh, the wiggles. Um, uh, I've actually got a grandson now, I know, hard to believe. Uh, but uh, the Wiggles program hypes up these kids and then their la very last number is something like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and brings them all back down so they calmly leave. Very good health and safety there. So programming accordingly uh, for, for, um, for safety. Sets and scenery, stage mechanics, all of those things require some degree of design. So we've got responsibilities in health and safety for design and um, the responsibilities lie with uh, this sort of group of people really and I'm talking about legal responsibilities now. So as a, um, as a client or, a, or the person commissioning the design you have responsibilities. Uh, so if you're a company, uh, if, if you're a theatre company and you're um, engaging somebody to do a set design for you, you have some degree of responsibility making sure that that design is safe asking the right questions, uh, that sort of thing. The designer themselves has responsibilities. The people who manufacture and construct whatever it is that you're designing. Suppliers, definitely. Um, if you're bringing in cheap stuff from another country that has l lower uh, health and safety regs than us, then you need to make sure that they're up to, to the standard for New Zealand. Uh, and obviously the end users have their own responsibilities. Everybody has a primary duty of care, all PCBUs. Does everyone know what a PCBU is by now? Person conducting a business or undertaking. Yes, no, nod, shake, yes. <laughs> it's the company. It's basically a company or an organisation, whoever's in charge. Um, that's, that's what a PCBU is. I don't know why they can't say company or person in charge. But. Uh, so you've got, you, your primary duty of care is regardless of what you're doing, you need to ensure the safety of everybody uh, that's affected directly or indirectly by your activities. So that will be your workers, it might be um, people who are working, um, engaged not directly by you but f are working for you. Um, it may be other people who just happen to be sharing the space with you at the time, uh, caterers, 
um, if you're doing a corporate gig, that type of people. Visitors, and in the visitors comes audience, obviously, and, um, and just random members of the public who happen to be strolling past. Um, and where the design uh, legal um, stuff comes in is, is a th an area that they call upstream duties. Um, and anybody probably who works in, a, in, the, in the business of, of hiring or selling equipment will know about this sort of thing or should know about this sort of thing. Um, so the spe specific, specific, <laughs> specific uh, duties for anybody who designs plant substances or structures, uh, or anyone who manufactures those, imports, supplies or installs. The legal uh, duties are specific to designers that you, um, it, it, the legal duties are if you're designing any of those things, plants, a substance or a structure. But it doesn't mean that if you're designing something else that you don't have to follow the law. It just means that there are specific things relevant to people who design those. And I've just put in some examples there of the types of things in our industry that we're talking about under those sorts of uh, categories. So access equipment, flying systems, um, if you're designing actual equipment or tools or anything like that, um, that falls under that. Substances, um, and but probably more importantly, or the one example that I know that I can grasp onto better is uh, the structures. So set, staging, event structures, those sorts of things, if there's a design element to those, then you have specific legal duties. Um, and your duties are that you must make sure that they're safe. <laughs> Easy enough. Um, but with regard to all kinds of aspects of it, so it's not just that they're um, safe at the end, but also that they're safe to manufacture, that they're safe to construct, uh, that, the ha that they're safe to handle, uh, the use, obviously, the storage. Storage is probably more about substances. Um, cleaning and maintenance and repair and demolition and disposal. So you need to consider all of those aspects of the life of whatever it is you're designing and, uh, and make sure that, that what you're doing is safe for that. You also have a duty to test. Uh, and that means that you actually, as a designer, you have a legal duty to carry out the, con the calculations and analysis that you need to make sure that something's safe. So again, with structures, with staging, with, um, with stage roofs, that sort of stuff, you would have done the calculations that, or, or engaged someone else to, to, to do the calculations to make sure that whatever it is that you're designing um, actually stands up to the conditions that you're expecting it to live in. And you, the final duty is that you have a duty to inform others. So as a designer, if somebody comes, if your production manager comes up to you and says, I need that information, you have a duty to provide it as well. Um, and that's part of communicating um, across different people who manage health and safety on a site. So the concept of safety in design uh, I find interesting um, in that um, it, it, it sort of, um, I've just touched on the legal stuff, but this is bringing it a little bit broader. And it's the concept of, of thinking about safety at every step of the process um, before you start, planning it into everything that you do um, so that um, uh, it's, it's a lot easier uh, to manage. So it's something that um, I'm aware of happens in civil engineering projects all the time. Uh, people who are designing the, uh, the roads, the, big, uh, the highway, um, that kind of thing, um, and often happens in uh, projects to build um, buildings as well. As I said, it considers safety at every step of the design process, uh, but it also has a life cycle approach, which is it looks at the entire life cycle of whatever it is you're designing and factors in what's going to be needed at each step uh, to make it safe. It's broad and uh, it involves broader multi-level consultation um, and there are multiple phases um, to, to doing this. Came out better than I thought it was going to. Uh, this is stolen from uh, the WorkSafe New Zealand Good Practice Guidelines for Health and Safety and Design. It's, a, it's quite a good little document. WorkSafe actually just as a little byline, um, they write some pretty good information and it's fairly readable. Um, uh, you don't have to be a health and safety expert. They take a lot of things out of the legislation and go, this is actually how we're interpreting it. 
um, and this is you know what we suggest that you do. So what this basically says that the ability to, uh, to influence safety in the design diminishes as you go through the design process. So if a design process is, uh, you know, you, you're going from concept um, initially, you've got, a, you've got a lot of control on, on the ability to be able to factor in things that will affect safety. As you go on, and everyone will be aware of this, and everyone will have worked probably in one of those buildings that I'm talking about. As you go on, you suddenly go, you know, you're in the building, you've got a brand new building, um, and then you suddenly, you know, it's been constructed and you go, oh, we really need this. And to retrofit it, whatever it is that you need to make it safe, is way, way, way more costly uh, and, 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 and painful and probably less effective than if you'd just taken the time to think about it prior to, to um, to go and getting to that point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to whip through this and then we could probably have a name and shame session later on all of those buildings. It's, um... <laughs> so the life cycle approach, no, we don't, we don't do blame. We don't do blame. Life cycle approach. And I've adapted this from that guide and basically looking at, and I'm sort of looking at entertainment design life cycle and probably in my mind I had a set design um, in there. Um, but this is the, the, what I kind of came up with anyway of, of this, the, the, the process that happens within the life, the whole life um, of, the, um, of whatever it is you're designing. So you start with the concept obviously um, and you might be chatting to all sorts of people about that. Um, if it's a set, you know, you'll, you'll have your directors and your, 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 your team, your design team together. You go in, into the design phase, you design it, there'll be consultation around that anyway. Then you go into the construction, um, transporting it potentially to site to, to, um, and, and installing it. Um, then I've put in there, um, this is an addition to the one that was in the guide, but environment, and, and with that I mean environment and setting. So it might be an outside event, uh, that kind of environment, but also like the setting of where it's going to sit in the world, who's going to have access to it. Um, I've just had the good fortune of working on the um, second unit event down at the waterfront. I don't know, out-of-towners may not know about it, but it's a completely immersive uh, kind of audience can go anywhere kind of event. Um, and when audience can go anywhere, you suddenly have to up the game uh, in terms of tying things down and securing things and making sure uh, that 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 lighting levels are uh, adequate on stairs and things like that because you're dealing with people who aren't used to the world. Um, so that's what I mean by that. The actual end use of whatever it is, um, maintenance, um, and 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 how you know how you're going to fix it, how you're going to clean it, um, that sort of thing. The deinstallation. Uh, I've got in there the transport again. That might be off-site to be demolished or or recycled, or if it's in a touring cycle back again to install an environment, and that's got its own set of, of risks and hazards. Are there any questions at this stage about that? Because I'm... <laughs> Where's my water? <laughs> all good? Does this, this is sort of making sense? No, it's all right, mate. It's, it's, a <laughs> it's just a joke. Yeah. <clears throat> so the life cycle approach and the safety and design is that at every step of this process, you would be consulting with the people who know best about... Um, whatever it is um, that's involved in that bit. So as a designer, you would talk to the people who are constructing uh, whatever it is you're designing uh, and, and, and figure out, is there any element of your design that makes it unsafe for them to construct? Is the materials that you've chosen, uh, you know, are there health and safety issues around that? Um, you know, and, and have that discussion as to whether or not actually, you know what, we won't use MDF uh, because this is going to involve a lot of cutting and, 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 and sanding or whatever. We're going to use something else that doesn't do our lungs in so much or whatever uh, that is. Um, you would talk to the people installing it to, to kind of go, well, in, in actual fact, it's way better if we don't have massive as sheets of ply. It would be better if we have the, ti the tiny wee ones, because we've only got a little crew, <laughs> uh, and do it that way. So we're, we're eliminating, you know, at each step, we're eliminating the hazards uh, that, that we, we all come across, and we're thinking about it. Um. 
So with the design aspect of it, you've got your pre-design phase. So as a designer, you would uh, consult with, as I said before, with your, with your producers, your directors, your, your clients. Um, and, and as part of that, you'd establish the roles and responsibilities. So you, you make it very clear who's going to be responsible for which bits of the safety plan and discuss it. And I highly recommend that you'd write it down as well. Now, you can't contract out of your responsibilities um, <laughs> legally, uh, but you know, as a team, you can decide on you know, which aspects you're going to discuss together and who's going to be responsible. You t obtain, uh, obtain information on the intended uses of whatever it is that you're going to be designing. Uh, the environment uh, and settings, industry known issues and um, known risks and possible control measures. So you just, at this pre-design phase, you would gather uh, all of this information. Intended uses, I've got a little uh, side story on that. Um, anyone ever worked in the piano in Christchurch? Yeah. <laughs> I was, um, I was, I was, interestingly doing a theatre show with uh, Indian Ink Theatre Company in there, and it was probably in the certainly the first two months, I think, was it, Dave? I can't remember. Yeah, of their of their being open. That venue was designed to be only for, correct me if I'm wrong, for concerts. It's a, it was designed to be acoustically very lively. Uh, it was designed certainly that you couldn't get any access whatsoever to the lighting uh, and the lighting angles are uh, way up there. <laughs> I was doing a mask show. Uh, we need light and eyes to make masks come alive. When you talk to the people who were behind the building of that, that was always their intention, that it was, not, it was only going to be used for concerts. But the reality is that what venue in New Zealand is only used for what it was originally done for? So, so much more could have been added in to that design that would have meant that it could have been more multi-purpose. Uh, and actually useful. I mean, my, my recommendation going back to, to the company I work for, don't, don't do it. Don't book a show in there. Um, it, was, it was too lively um, for, for spoken word at the time. I, they probably fixed that a bit. But I imagine, and this was a few, going back a few years, that there's been a lot of retrofitting of stuff um, to try and deal with those problems for when it's being used, when it's not for that purpose. Um, so it, it's kind of it's obtaining the intended uses, but also you know encouraging real, realism around that, um, particularly with something like a building. Uh, with a theatre set, it's usually pretty standard what they're going to use it for. Then there's a concept design phase, and um, these are all terms: concept design phase, pre-design phase. I got out of that brochure. I'm, I'm not that up on my design stuff, so. Um, uh, the, the, a lot of that has been referring back to that. but um, So con the concept design phase is identify the possible risks at each step of that life cycle. So it, that's when you go and talk to all of the users. Um, and it's broad communication. It focus on the end user uh, each step. So if you're designing a venue and you're going to be putting catwalks in, then talk not just to the theatre manager but to the technicians who are the ones who are kneeling on the grating, um, the ones who are trying to uh, focus a light on a bar that's below the catwalk and you've got a really quite sharp kick rail that digs into your ribs. Um, and by the way, you've only got you know two points of contact, which is your shins. Um, <laughs> And understand what their job entails. Now, for many, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, pre I'm preaching, <laughs> preaching to the choir here, I know this. Uh, but this is the concept behind it. And, and if we can encourage the people who are designing these, these types of things um, to do it. But understanding what exactly they're going to be doing. And this, as I say, this transfers right through. This includes, you know, if you're, if you're lighting, doing a lighting design for an event site, uh, you know, talk to the end users. You need to talk... Uh, to the first aid people, find out what lighting they need to be able to get to people uh, during the event or for their areas. You need to know, you know, what access ways and things when it gets dark um, and talk to the um, health and safety people about, you know, how much lighting is needed for egress and 
those sorts of things. So it's, it, it, it's a concept that goes across um, multiple disciplines. Sometimes you might need facilitation, and it, this is the civil engineering side of things. Um, uh, I know um, that you know if you were building a building, you might have somebody coming in specifically just to look to facilitate the health and safety and design aspect of of the uh, the project. And they're the people who who, who uh, help get the the end users to the designers and in the same room and chatting about what's possible and what's not without people getting too emotional. Uh, and then you need to assess the risks. Um, and again, that's going back to all of those elements of, of who uses it, who maintains it, um, that sort of thing. With the piano in Christchurch, and I'm sorry, naming and shaming, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I don't know how they maintain their lights. I think you have to get a cherry picker in to get access to them. Um, is that end cost going to be more than it would have been to have put some structure in place uh, that meant that that could happen uh, without that? Um, looking at, you know, all, all the way through to, uh, I mean, you know, with a building, the, it's end life in 30, 40 years time, you know, how's it going to be decommissioned, how's it going to be safely um, broken down uh, and got rid of. Uh, yeah, good, right. And then uh, design development. Um, so this is the next step of this. Um, We've had the pre-design, we've had the conceptual design, now the design development. So the design then, once you've gathered all this information, you need to design to eliminate risk. It's always the case with the law is that where possible you need to eliminate the risks. Um, and it sort of regardless of the risk. If it's not practicable, you've probably heard of that term as well, so if it's not sort of feasible uh, to eliminate the risk, then the design controls need to be um, put in place that minimise the risk. And they should follow the hierarchy of control. Has anyone seen this before? Anyone that didn't come to my session yesterday? <laughs> the hierarchy of control is the order in which things should be considered if you're managing risks. Uh, and it's the most effective and, ef and efficient uh, way. So first and foremost, eliminate. If you can, eliminate. If you've got chemicals in your workshop that you never use, get Eliminate them. Um, take them to a proper disposal place. Um, there's no need to have risks there that, that you don't need. Um, then uh, the next step is if you can't eliminate, uh, then you need to minimise. Um, and that's, you know, that's how the law's written. But the minimising has different levels of effectiveness. So the more effective controls are the ones that I call level two. Um, and the, the substitute was something that's safer. Uh, that's the example maybe of, of you know, the MDF dust. You use something else that's not as MDF dusty. Um, isolate. Um, is there something that you can put in place that will prevent something from happening? So if you've got an effect, say you've got um, a bit of stage mechanics underneath your stage that's, uh, that's like um, a, a sort of lift that, that sort of shoots people up into the air, um, for instance, or that kind of thing, and it's, and it's got a scissor lift contraption underneath the stage, and then you push a button and it brings it up suddenly, and suddenly somebody appears. Putting, you know, what are the risks? The risks are that somebody can actually be in amongst that mechanism underneath the stage at the time. So the, to isolate, what would you do? You put barriers up. You might put perspex around that, so that when you're loading onto the platform, the person onto the platform, you open a gate, you close a gate, and then everyone's protected. Nobody's actually going to get in harm's way when the mechanism fires. That sort of thing. That's a bit of engineering controls there as well. Engineering controls are the sorts of things like, and the example I always call on is the micro switches on, on, on scissor lifts and things like that, or on, on your um, on your genies. Um, it won't work unless the safety things are in place. So that's at the upper level. Now the thing about that is um, you've got, you've got the effectiveness. It's more effective to use those. That they're, they're better at controlling risks. You can't bypass the risks if you are going for level two. But they're also uh, less susceptible to human error. So if you have something that you must close the gate before something works, then you can't decide as an individual, I'm not going to do that. 
or you can, but it does take, you know, a Leatherman and a bit of lecky tape or something. You have to kind of maliciously make that decision. Uh, you know, and some people do that. I mean, we've all worked in those environments as well where, um, you know, the, the micro switches have been bypassed to make things easier. Um, if you are going to do that, just as an aside, do make sure that your other controls are effective in managing the risk um, because those micro switches are there for a reason. But that's a classic example of poor design. If the technician is bypassing the micro switches, nobody asks the technician how they're going to be using that bit of equipment uh, and, and designing it um, in a way that makes it that you don't have to bypass those. <laughs> um, so end use there. The next level down is the administrative controls, and that's everything else that falls out of, of that. So that's all the stuff uh, like briefings, uh, like putting up a sign, um, like um, taping down cables and that. They don't actually physically stop you from coming in contact with the hazard, um, uh, and they're way less effective, and they're way more vulnerable uh, to human error, uh, and they're way more vulnerable to choice. Um, with that. Um, so if you've got a risk that's not that high, that it's not that much harm, then administrative controls are usually okay. But if you've got something that can maim and kill, you should be up in level two. And then finally at the very end is the personal protective equipment, mm -hmm. which if you want to hear more about me bleat along about that, come to the session this afternoon. Uh, and then at the bottom of all of that is your emergency preparedness. So that's making sure that you've got a rescue kit for people. Um, if they do fall. So uh, when you're doing your design, you should, uh, the, the, the more critical the risks, the more harm that can happen, uh, the, more, the, the worse the injuries, the more you should try and, 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 and hang around in level two in solving your solutions. <clears throat> Uh, and then once you've done your assessments, then uh, you'd, you'd review the design solution and, um, and make, sure, you know, make sure that what you've actually decided on is effective uh, and efficient and controlling the risk, but also that it's not introducing new risks, which is, that's a classic uh, um, issue. Um, one of those example of that might be um, like an event site um, post Post Christchurch this year, a lot of events I know in Wellington were suddenly being told that they needed to up their security uh, and so and do bag checks. But there's a danger with that that then they then put in mechanism to do bag checks in the egress routes. That means that if there is an emergency, that that people will be tripping over bag check stuff, um, that sort of thing. So the control measures that were being added um, uh, to check bags were actually creating another whole risk. So you've got to. You know, if you're going to add another control, then make sure that you check to make sure that you're not uh, you're not creating a risk. Then it's a then it becomes a repeat and redesign and repeat and redesign. And as part of that process, you you you're redesigning. You're going back to the people who know what, how it's going to be used, and then you're coming back uh, and and redesigning, uh, and then you finalise the design. That's it. Simple. <laughs> I guess the, the, the key take-home message is, is the consultation aspect of all of this. Uh, it, it's, it's as a designer talking to the people, the end users, and finding out exactly what it is that they're going to be doing uh, and trying to draw out of people uh, you know, what the end, end use is going to be um, for that. And I, know, I do realise that the more complex the design, the more complex if you're designing a venue, for instance, you've got a lot of people in the room. Uh, you've got and people sort of arm wrestling over lighting positions versus that just a little bit more acoustic liveliness or whatever it is they're after. Um, but golly, the number of times that I've been in venues where uh, there's a lovely catwalk uh, which should have had a nice shot, front of house shot to stage, but the lighting bar has to be way down there. Um, I wish I had a hot dinner for every one of those. So is there any questions or anyone got any examples they want to share? Um, I'm just kind of wondering, maybe it's outside the scope of this, but just wondering what might be available for producers and designers in this, along this vein. Because I end up sitting in you know, first or second design meetings with 
a director and a designer who have already spent six months talking about it and present a set or a plan or an idea that has some massive safety concerns that they're now not willing to budge on because they're not aware of it when they started. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, uh, and you're coming from a production management. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I guess it's all about education, really, and I mean, that's why I decided on this topic to speak about it, is to try and talk to the designers as well, because, and that's why I hit first up with some law. <laughs> uh, because they do have responsibilities for that, as do the producers. Um, anybody in that chain has responsibilities to make sure that, that, that there is safety. Um, and if they've neglected that and something were to happen, then um, you know it's it's likely that WorkSafe would go after multiple people on multiple levels, and it, you know very definitely could be the designer, uh, particularly if it's recorded in a meeting that you brought up those concerns and that didn't happen. But you don't want to be in that position, you know. You don't want to be mopping up the blood on the floor and going, oh, "I told you so," you know. Um, so it's it's about, uh, and it's a tricky one. Uh, but it's something I've become more and more aware with, of the more I work in safety. It's all about communication. Um, and, you, and, and, and a, a lot of the issues that people come to me with, it's about being able to break down those. I think the key from my, and my, I learned this the hard way as somebody who's into safety, is to not sit in a meeting and go, well, oh, that's not going to work um, straight up. Um, that's that's a bit of a downer on people's designs, <laughs> especially if they've spent six months designing it. You go, oh, interesting, that's cool. Let me take that away and I'll risk assess it for you. And then you can come up with the sort of facts and figures. And then bringing them into the conversation about how it's going to be fixed and what you can do together to, to do that and engaging everybody that's affected. And letting people have the power as well. You know, if you're putting an actor on a stage, on a, on a platform up wherever or whatever, they've got a right to have input into their safety as well uh, as a worker. Yeah, but a good point. Anybody else got any other? Who's got a gnarly venue? <laughs> I mean, I think that thing of the retrofitting is, is really quite valid uh, with a lot of things. Um, for some reason, I, I can't remember why, but the th I'm picking on Christchurch now, but the Theatre Royal had something front of house, some funny thing, some funny way of accessing the front of house bars. As well. Yeah, yeah, that needed a ladder to get up, yeah. Which is, you know, that's not recommended best practice for getting up places, um, those sorts of things. The people who work in those places know best, you know. Uh, the people who have who have, have toured uh, a lot and, and that know what the ins and outs are and what the best designs are. And it's tapping into those people. Uh, we need to have this conversation with architects because they like things to look pretty. Like, for instance, the refurb of the town hall in Christchurch. It's a lot of the problems we used to have are still there. Yeah, it's, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no, we don't need to put that there. So then it gets put in three months, six months, one year down the track. There may be budget for a refit, or there may not be. And you just, we just deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And then you're putting yourself at risk often because, you know, because if you, you know, you're not allowed to put the perch positions in because it ruins the historical look of the blah, 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 blah. But every show needs a perch position that you've put in so far. So you end up putting in a temporary one that doesn't have you know, that's not as structurally sound or whatever. Um, yeah, I feel your pain uh, with that one. But there are, so, yeah, there are some that are ridiculously new venues that have the same sorts of things. And, and I, I think it's, um, this concept is something that is out there in the civil engineering world. I know um, I, I, the, the workshop I attended was, was run by Becker, who are a big a project management civil engineering company uh, and they it, it was actually quite an interesting one it was a few years back and um, we we had the little talk and then they handed out a whole lot of scenarios and I, m the scenario I got was something to do with some roading scenario and we would gather in our groups of scenarios and I looked at the person next to me and they had the Marlborough um, ASB theatre and I said oh can we swap 
<laughs> and, do you know anything about that? Oh, so let's swap. So we sat there, and it was quite it was quite funny because we were meant to come up with what we thought might be some of those end user designs, and nobody was expecting somebody from the industry in there. And so we chatted about them, and they said, "Does anyone know anything?" And I said, "Well, yeah. If you've got the lighting bars, your lighting bridges, you need to make sure that you know you can kneel on them, and they're not gonna they're not uncomfortable, and the, the kick rail's not uncomfortable, and the lighting positions are da 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 da." And the guy sort of started to go a little bit kind of paler. Uh, and I, I said, well, you've got through this process, haven't you? you you've actually done your consultation. And, and he was like, yeah. I said, who did you consult? And they went, the venue manager. And I'm like, man, you didn't get to the end user. You know, the venue manager uh, is, knows that much, but the theatre technician will know even more. Um, from memory, actually, uh, my experience of the venue, they did all right uh, with that anyway. Uh, but it's really getting to the right people um, and having access to them. Um, and that's where a project as big as that would have somebody actually just dedicated on the health and safety side of things to be doing that facilitation. Um, and it's something that they do as part of their project management the safety and design is incorporated into it all, rather than that whole, hey, now we'll talk about safety later. It's just incorporating it right through the entire project. As a whole, in your experience, everybody's got stories of bad venues and <laughs> bad designs. Is that indicative of how bad it is out there, or are, is that just a very small thing and they get 99% of it right, but everyone just remembers the 1% that they yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know, I, always, I, I guess I remember the good venues, but the ones that cause me pain <laughs> or fear are probably etched in my memory more. I, yeah, I don't know, I mean, I sort of pick on the venue thing, but I mean, it's, 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 it's a way complicated thing. It's, as I said, it's something that I wouldn't want to, you know, have as my sole job. Um, I mean, there are, all, there are always things that could be better. I think the frustration as an end user is often, oh, not again. You know, I've just gone to the Gisborne one that's just been refit. I mean, this is a few years ago now, again, and we were in there relatively new and going, really? Really? I still have to hang upside down to rig my light down there from that height. That's just not safe. And and this is kind of pre-me getting a bit more educated. To I've been now be going, that's really not right. And if you're going to do that, where is the points that I can attach my harness onto at least? You know, if you are going to have to do with that option, and you've worked through every other option that's available, then at least put some infrastructure in there that means that I can safely tether on it. Um, and that to retrofit that stuff is a right royal pain. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think on the small scale, I think the set designers and lighting designers and that do pretty well, uh, generally. Um, I guess it depends um, on, the, on the gigs. Um, Less so event sites, um, but, yeah. but it is just something to be. It, it's more of a uh, yeah. It's just a sort of an awareness raising thing of like, hey, you know, we don't just have to tack safety on the end of everything. Uh, it's actually a part of everything we do. And my work down at Second Unit, uh, you know, fortunate enough to just be focused on safety, which is amazing. It's a it's it's a, uh, a great role to be in, and it was just because they identified that they had a lot of risks. Um, and to go in there, and everyone in a meeting would be talking about something, and then they all turn to me and go, oh, Cass going to say we can't do it. And I'm like, it's not my decision. <laughs> but mostly, what people were doing was coming to me and saying, hey, I've got this problem, can you come and have a look at it, and I think this is the solution. And you go, mm, sweet, you know, you're doing great, well done. It's, it's making people aware that it's, it's not up to me to come in after the event and say, no, you can't do it, or whatever. It's, it's, you, it's you going, what are the risks? What could possibly go wrong with what we're doing? You know, and how can we design it so that that's not going to happen? Do you have any yeah. advice for uh, people who have to deal with maybe community groups that <coughs> might produce some paperwork that states their intentions, but then the actual object that rolls in the building is quite different? Oh, that's always a, yeah, that old chestnut. Yeah. Actually, that, that's, it's not only community groups. Uh, again, um, you know, I've just been working on this big project that was a devised piece, and we, we came up with stuff that really, um, in the production week, was not the 
it's, it's, this is a immersive experience kind of an event. And it really wasn't generating the buzz <laughs> that we wanted. Uh, and so then we needed to add extra buzz items, which adds extra risk. Uh, and so when I go back to my paperwork that I presented to the, the uh, executive director and the, the chair of the board, is this is how we, these are critical risks, this is how we're managing it, this is really not what we're doing anymore. Um, because things do change, uh, that doesn't answer your question. That just gives you another example. Uh, no, I don't have any advice. On that. <laughs> I think. Uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, that comes down to monitoring and um, and as much as possible, the conversations. I mean, it's um, that you would have beforehand um, and you know getting the paperwork and kind of going. Is, has any of this changed as they're coming through? Um, paperwork is, is you know, paperwork's paperwork. It's it's not really, it's not the be all and end all of everything. It's I mean it's it's very flawed paperwork. You know I do great paperwork, but do I communicate the paperwork to the relevant people? Not so well. That's something I'd like to get better at. Um, uh, it's all very well to have written it, but does the person who's there at midnight? care. <laughs> they just want to get it done and go to bed. Um, you know, so people will bypass paperwork. Um, I guess that's where, again, with that hierarchy of control is having uh, the things in place that um, mean that people can't change things. Um, and that's for your real, really critical risks. Um, and to do with your building, that would be locking them out of the places that they can fall from heights or those sorts of things. Do you have an example, JR, of the sorts of things? I mean, without oh, naming or uh, shaming? You know, we, five to seven times a year we get the, the Petrie or the Mr. Cedar or the um, Youth Theatre come in and there's a, there's a piece of set or there's something else that they thought would be fine and what often happens is I end up spending a lot of extra time at the building, usually with their stage manager or their technicians who had no responsibility towards deciding what this piece was, that was either the director or the um, or the company could. And it's just one of those things, it's a constant conversation as you say about how do we stop wasting time on this, but it just got maybe you have No, I mean, other than, than doing the lovely educating that you, I know you do down there is, is to try and, and get, you know, get them up to speed prior to, I mean, I think the thing with community stuff is that there's still the same inherent risks and, um, and uh, you know, there's a little bit of a danger of stuff being put together by people who aren't qualified to put it together and haven't necessarily done the engineering calculations and things like that. But you know, that's I think there are there are times and places where you need to engage the professionals. Um, if you're building a structure that people have to stand on, then you, it needs to be structurally sound. You need to have engaged somebody that knows something, be it the local builder or whatever. Um, you can't just knock a couple of nails into something and call it a set. Um. <laughs> you can at home. <laughs> Different rules apply. <laughs> you still have your cubby house, it's alright. Just something that might be helpful. Um, Vicky Cooksley, and I am going to name it, it's not to shame, but Vicky Cooksley has been working with Young and Hungry actually have a really good process of how to handle that design decision making and health and safety and things at a very early level. So yeah. it really might be worthwhile talking to Young and Hungry about that mm -hmm. process. And then I think it's about actually being proactive with our community groups and actually having a couple of meetings with them earlier on, which is I think building on something that you said about building awareness early in the process. Yeah. People yeah. Who are designing. Yeah. That if you're going to come into our venue, we love you coming into our venue. So let's let's build our community groups up and, and their knowledge. Yeah, and it might be even just sort of having that one pager that says, "Have you got any of these?" <laughs> and then resending that out the day before they come. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's absolutely classic uh, what you what you're saying, Jr. It, it's 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 often the case, you know. And then they turned up with naked flame, and um, you know, <laughs> and you and you go, oh. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. And, and, and it's fine if you're on. 
But if you may be uh, having some annual leave, heaven forbid, and you've got somebody else that's subbed in who doesn't have perhaps the uh, experience or, 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 the, or the, the knowledge to be able to say, oh, no, you can't do that, um, uh, then that becomes difficult. Um, and, you, and you're putting the onus on you know, some sort of gatekeeper there. And, you, and there's a, that's potential for conflict. It's so, so much harder when people are in their production week to change things um, because they're tired, you know, <laughs> they're emotional, um, you know, they've just gone through however many weeks of rehearsals uh, and to make those changes then uh, can seem impossible and a bit insensitive. But if it's all planned for in advance. Any other discussion points? Anybody? I just uh, I'm just going to finish with um, it's my favourite bit from Rot Lidditz. It's uh, it's the vend vending machine, um, and, <laughs> and it's got everything. It's got like uh, like tampons, uh, condoms. It's got deodorant. Um, it's got the stuff in there that I said to the guys, "What's that for?" And they said, "Gig butt." <laughs> I was like, "Oh." Cool. <laughs> uh, and, you know, everything, uh, WD-40, uh, it's got spare T-shirts. Um, up the top, it's actually got a hammock. Um, <laughs> wet wipes, which might go with gig butt, I don't know. Uh, chocolate. Uh, it's my favourite vending machine ever. Uh, so they had thought of, um, of absolutely everything. If you ever do get a chance, if you ever just happen to find yourself in rural Pennsylvania. Um, it's an amazing, amazing complex. Um, it's, it's very, very cool what they do there. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that further as well. I'm very grateful once again to the Salican Scholarship Fund for giving me the opportunity to get over there and talk to the my people. <laughs> Family home. Cool. Thank you very much. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and that's lunch. <laughs> <laughs>